Assembly Committee Room. Okay, so good morning everybody and welcome to the 55th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference and we don't have any witnesses, no witnesses this morning. Today, so. no. Um, the meeting will be broadcast live when open to the public and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage on the OM Assembly website. Just to remind members to mute their devices when not speaking. Um, and just to advise members, this is a fairly hefty agenda to get through in an hour, so um, we'll try and get through as quickly as possible. Um, uh, I suppose first item on the agenda then is apologies, and we have apologies from Gordon. Yeah, we, we also think John Stewart might either be late or not be able to make it, okay. so he's just flagged that up. Thank you. Um, so moving on then to um, item number two, which is Chair's business, and um, I would just like to welcome Gary back to the committee and also thank Paul Gibbon for his work um, in, in Gary's absence. So we also would like to put on record um, our best wishes to Gordon for a speedy recovery as well. So moving on then to 2.1, that in page five of your pack, there is a statement from the Finance Minister on the establishment of a fiscal council and a fiscal commission. The Finance Minister has advised that contained within the new decade, new approach is a commitment to establish an independent fiscal council that would assess and report on the sustainability of the executive's finances and spending proposals. Um, and the fiscal council mission statement states that it's a permanent body which will bring greater transparency and independent scrutiny to the current and future state of Northern Ireland's public finances. Um, and I suppose the, the fiscal commission, the finance minister has also set up to look at um, potential other, um, other fiscal powers and potential devolution of those. Um, so if members are agreed that we would seek briefings from the Fiscal Council and the Fiscal Commission. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Moving on then to 2.2, there is correspondence from the EU's Affairs Manager with an update on common frameworks at page 32 of your pack. The EU manager advises under Schedule 3 of the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, the British Government has a statutory requirement to report, on, report to the British Parliament every three months on progress made on the development of UK prom common frameworks. The 10th EU Withdrawal and Common Frameworks report detailing progress from the 26th of September to the 25th of December 2020 was published on the 18th of March and is at page 34 of your pack. In addition to the progress made, the report details the UK Government did not use powers under Section 12 of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 to temporarily maintain existing limits on devolved competence in some policy areas. The most recent analysis of common frameworks published since September 2020 sets out each of the 150 areas of EU law that intersect with the devolved competence of um, the North uh, Assembly and Executive. This latest report advises that the Frameworks Programme now consists of 32 active common frameworks, all of which are relevant to here. So are members content to note? Chair, just, mm -hmm. just to say this has moved a lot slower than we anticipated. We thought there'd be much more to do on common frameworks by now, but it just seemed to be a really slow process. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Moving on then to 2.3, there is correspondence from the, the Chairperson's Liaison Group regarding committee consideration of legislation. It is at page 54 of your pack. At the meeting on the 2nd of March, the, the CLD discussed correspondence received from the Committee for Justice regarding the Executive's decision to allow a condensed committee stage of the damages return and investment bill. Chairperson shared the concerns raised by the Committee for Justice and agreed that the correspondence should be forwarded to all committees for their consideration. The Executive reached its decision on the basis that it recognises that it is imperative for the Bill to pass all of its stages before the summer recess. The Committee stage needs to be concluded by the 30th of April. So that is just for members to note. Okay, so moving on then to 2.4, there is a clerk's memo at page 60 of your pack regarding the informal meeting that the committee had with the Vice Chancellor of Queen's and other senior staff in Queen's last um, Thursday the 18th. Issues discussed included the September 2021 admissions, the establishment of a stakeholder group and the staff and student experience so far and also funding. Um, it was a very, I suppose, useful meeting that we had last Thursday with, with Queen's, um, the stakeholder group that has been set up in relation to the admissions for 2021 um, seems to be 
a, a fairly um, useful vehicle for even broader discussion, um, and it's something that we would we would be quite um, keen to to get a little bit more information around. So, if members are agreed, we would seek to engage further with that FEHE stakeholder group to seek interfaces with the committee's work and to provide support for the work of that group. Um, there is also, I suppose, in, in the course of the discussion, um, it, it kind of transpired that that group potentially has um, potential. <laughs> potentially has potential, um, to, to look at, at issues more broadly in, in the FEHE space and where there's space for greater cooperation and collaboration. So um, if the committee, committee has also agreed, we'd seek some research on the University of California model that brings together FE and HE, and that we would also write to the Education Committee around the committee's work across skills, FE and HE, to seek its views on how to ensure alignment between the work of the two committees. That we would also engage further with Queen's regarding its applications for city deal and region deal supporting projects and the Vice Chancellor's suggestions around research centres of excellence and the, the work of Science Foundation Ireland. Um, members will be aware that there were some commitments in New Decade, New Approach um, to all island research institutions. So um, it, just to get a little bit more in, information around that from the department about what is actually happening in that space. And also that we would engage with FE and HE sectors regarding those NDNA commitments. So that's a pretty quick run through. Members are content. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So moving on then to item number three, which is our draft minutes at page 66 of your pack. There is a copy of the draft minutes from the meeting held on the 10th of March. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Yeah. Thank and you. then at page 72 of your pack, there is a copy of the draft record of decisions from that meeting. Also, we, we took some decisions by correspondence. So are members content with those? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so moving on then to item number four, which is matters arising. Um, at page 78 of the pack, there is um, a departmental response on the draft budget. budget. The committee asked a few questions when we had the briefing. So we asked what equality screening there had been to date on the department's draft budget and what screening will take place and how funding set aside for Brexit and the protocol within the department's draft budget will be spent. So the, uh, just to highlight that the department has responded that there have been no equality implications presented by business areas. However, one business area has yet to finalise its screening. Once finalised, the outcome of the equality screening will be published on the DFE website. Do we know which division or which business no, area? No, they didn't specify. Okay. The department also advises that the funding set aside for the cost of the protocol and um, Brexit is currently being profiled in the department for the year ahead and so no individual budget lines can yet be confirmed. The, the funding is to be used for internal DFE costs and costs for the arm's length bodies from issues arriving from Brexit and the protocol. So that's just to note at this stage, and I'm sure we'll get the additional information once it becomes available. Sure, once um, active movement of those funds starts, it'll start fairly soon, uh, particularly once the ALB is starting to draw down in the new financial year. And I think we'll get a lot more information coming back on that at the minute. They're just kind of waiting for the new year to go. So a page, sorry, moving on then to 4.2, at page 80 of your pack, there is a departmental response regarding internet and technology poverty. Um, and the department has responded that it fully appreciates the impact of poor broadband on local communities, particularly in rural areas of the north. The department highlights Project Stratum will deliver a gigabit capable broadband infrastructure to more than 76,000 so primarily rural premises across the north, including 766 premises in the newton stewart gorchin area included in the intervention area. And that was where the individual whose correspondence we had forwarded to the department was from. The Hyperfast NI website, which has been developed by Fibus Networks, provides key information on the deployment phase of Project Stratum. This includes an online postcode address checker, enabling citizens and businesses to confirm if or when their premises are included for improvement. Um, the British government's digital Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport is currently taking forward a programme to replace 
Rural Gigabit Connectivity Programme, which closed on the 19th of February 2021. Um, Peter, I think, is there some additional information available There's on that a, now? You, they, they were making announcements last week, um, so there should be plenty now that we can bring back Okay. Uh, in detail, so we'll bring that back for next time. Okay, thank you. Moving on then to 4.3 at page 82 of your pack, um, there is a response from the department in respect of COVID financial support schemes. The department advises the travel agencies operating retail premises have benefited from 100% rates holiday for 12 months in 2020-21. Businesses employing staff would also have been eligible for the coronavirus job retention scheme, while self-employed travel agents or tour operators would also have been able to claim for lost revenue through the self-employed income support scheme. Um, the Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents most recently engaged with the Finance Minister along with the First and Deputy First Minister and the Minister reiterates her support for targeted financial package for the industry which obviously has now happened um, and the additional rates holiday I think also yes, applies. applies yeah. um, so members are content to note that then? Thank you. Moving on then. To page 84 of your pack, there is a response from the department um, regarding Speed Up Britain's campaign for the British government to make changes to the electronic communications code. The department advises that this is a reserve matter led by DCMS. The department engages with DCMS to provide them with a local perspective. The rollout of 5G services is a commercial matter for privatised um, telecommunications providers. And the department has no plans currently to intervene in 5G rollout. Um, we have also written to councils in relation to the issues highlighted by Speed Up Britain. So if members are content to note at this stage until we get further spot responses. They have a, a group that's working on this chair, so they're, they're going to come back in a unified way. And I've already made contact with Scottish Futures. Um, and I bring back some more information on that. A lot of this comes down to... Uh, being able to use council-owned land um, and, and assets and so on. So I think the councils will have a much bigger involvement than potentially the department does at this stage. Okay. So moving on then to 4.5, there is a departmental response at page 86 of your pack um, regarding CBI's proposals on a roadmap for reopening the economy. So the department has highlighted that CBI and I are one of many key stakeholders who will help to ensure the Economic Recovery Action Plan becomes a reality and that the actions and interventions will be implemented over the next 12 to 18 months. The Department is delighted to have this endorsement and support from CBI and others, including the Tourism Alliance, and looks forward to working with them as the plan unfolds. So if members are content, we will pass that response on to CBI. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Moving on then to 4.6, there is a departmental response at page 88 of our PACs regarding the Commons Library briefing paper on the Turing scheme. So the department outlines what input it had to the development of the scheme and provides a written update on the um, on what access there will be for Erasmus students from the north and the progress of any replacement schemes and how replacement schemes will compare to Erasmus. So are members content to note that response? Joe, so that's very much for now. We're still getting information coming in about how the touring scheme will work. Um, it looks very much like it's it's got a similar structure, um, but th there's potential that it might do other things as well. Um, but as, as you've said, uh, students here still have access to Erasmus. Yeah, and I think the Welsh Government announced that they were um, setting up a, a scheme that was more similar to Erasmus, and yeah. it might be useful to get some information yeah, in, in relation that. to that as well. Um, and note that there doesn't seem to have been very much um, communication with the South around Erasmus, despite what they had said about um, supporting students from the North to continue to participate. Chair, it might be worth um, writing to the department to see where the contacts went, because I know the minister had indicated she had contacted her counterpart. Uh, it might just be useful to get an update on where that now sits. Okay, yes, Thanks. please. Okay, members content to note then? Yeah. 
So moving on then, there is a departmental response at page 91 of your pack regarding correspondence from UU Students' Union representative um, about the difference in university life compared to the previous academic year. So the Minister has advised that she has written to the universities and university colleges on behalf of students asking them to review their compliance with consumer law and provide assurances that in implementing their response to the pandemic they have given due regard to relevant consumer protection law. So are members content to forward this correspondence to the representative? Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. Chair. And then moving on, there is another departmental response at page 94 of your packs regarding the committee's queries on student support. Um, the department has outlined that the establishment of a portal is not feasible for students studying outside the North to register for financial support. The department states it's not in a position nor has access to the necessary information to process over 15,000 applications and payments for students from here who are studying elsewhere and to stand over the audit validity of that when processing all within the time scale. It also has stated in relation to hardship funds, the department says that it is for each institution to decide on individual applications for payments from its support funds within the criteria laid down by the department. On hardship funds across the islands, the department states that it does not hold this information. Um, and in relation then to the disruption payment to students, the department does not have legal powers to make these payments through public bodies outside of the north, such as the Students' Loan Company. So this is something that we're going to discuss in more detail. Yep, Chair. Um, Mr O'Dowd wanted to comment. We do have this later on on the agenda around uh, the SL1 and SR. But if Mr O'Dowd wants to... Mr O'Dowd wants to... Response in relation to students and uh, the emphasis placed on consumer legislation and regulations. And I'm wondering, is it worth our while corresponding with the Consumer Council just to get more information? Uh, have they a role to play in this? Could they act as an advocacy role for, for students in that regard? I know we're moving on to the SL1 later on, and I'm conscious of time as well. No problem, John. Yeah, sure. I'm just going to say that that's a, a new and interesting dimension because um, students are paying fees. And I suppose that's something we've not really caught up with is just how that applies to their consumer rights. So absolutely, we, we'll be get the Consumer Council in to talk to us about that. Yep, OK. OK, so moving on then to 4.9. Um, there is a departmental response at page... 97 of our packs regarding taxi operators and the CRBSS Part B. Invest NI was able to identi identify 49 taxi operators and or taxi drivers that have submitted an application to Invest NI under CRBSS Part B. Of these 49 applications, one has been paid, 13 have been rejected and 35 are currently being assessed uh, to establish their eligibility. So are members content to note that at this point? Yeah, this is a response, Chair, going back to the Infrastructure Committee. They've already received this. So it was really just for our information. OK. OK, thank you. So moving on then to 4.10, there's correspondence from um, OFMDFM at page 99 regarding EU exit preparedness and a media campaign. Um, OFMDFM advises that there has been significant levels of communication activity across departments, including stakeholder engagement, events, workshops, one-to-one -one advice, and paid-for communications activity. So this, this is a response to a letter we sent back in November. November. So obviously things have moved on significantly from that point. So are members content to note for now? Thank you. At page 112, then, of your packs, there is correspondence from the ERA Committee um, regarding RHI. The ERA Committee would like the Economy Committee to share the analysis of the RHI consultation responses once that has been completed. So are members content that we would do that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Moving on then to 4.12, there's correspondence from the EU Affairs Manager at page 113 regarding the Shared Prosperity Fund and Community Renewal Fund. The British Government published details of the Community Renewal Fund, which will provide £220 million in funding ahead of the introduction in 2022 of the Shared Prosperity Fund, 
which replaces EU structural funding. The note contains information on the UK CRF, including the, the British government's intentions for its delivery here in the north and how bids will be assessed. So are members content to note at this point? Chair, it might actually be worth getting the um, department's take on this. Obviously, as, as having the, had the main role in the distribution of ESF funds, um, it would be useful to see what the department thinks about how this will work, if members are content. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so moving on then to 4.13, there is correspondence from the EU Affairs Manager at page 120 regarding the protocol. There is a copy of two items of correspondence from Lord Canoe, Chair of the House of Lords European Union Committee, to Lord Frost, Minister of State for the Cabinet Office, on the 11th of March 2021. The correspondence relates to the operation of the protocol, including implementation issues, mitigations, UK-EU dialogue, engagements with stakeholders here, and the parliamentary scrutiny of the protocol. A second letter then relates to the British government's announcement of the temporary operational steps in relation to the protocol. So are members content to note those? I assume we will get responses when those come. Yeah, they've been very good at forwarding on all of their correspondence. Interesting to see those responses. <laughs> Um, then at page 136 of your pack, there's more correspondence from the EU Affairs Manager regarding the common frameworks and scrutiny process. There is a copy of correspondence from Chloe Smith, MP, Minister of State for the Constitution and Devolution, to William Rag, MP, Chair of Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, uh, dated the 25th of February. The correspondence contains further details on the status of common frameworks and scrutiny process, including in relation to imminent elections in Scotland and Wales. So are members content to note that? Thank you. Yeah. Moving on then to page 143, 4.15, there is correspondence from the utility regulator regarding regulation of the LPG market. The regulator advises that he does not have a legislative mandate in regards to LPG or other off-grid energy sources such as home heating oil. However, he advises that a new regulatory regime for LPG would need to be targeted and correctly reflect the potential risk and harm while ensuring the costs of regulatory intervention are identified and kept to a minimum. He highlights the DFE in, in its new energy strategy will take account of all forms of energy including LPG, and will therefore continue to work closely with DFE as they move towards a decision on the future energy strategy and any future regulatory powers for the utility regulator. So are members content that we would respond to the regulator supporting further engagement with the department and to forward the regulator's response to the original correspondent? Um, and obviously um, we have our briefing from officials on the energy strategy yeah. tomorrow isn't it yeah. yeah tomorrow after the concurrent okay so members content yeah. moving on then to 416 there is a copy of the hansard of our meeting on the 3rd of march um on the high street task force at page 145 of your packs um that's, that's the not TEO our meeting that was TEO. Yeah. <laughs> not no. <laughs> yeah. we were just claiming credit for that um, so, if members can tend to note. So, moving on then to item number five is the SL1, the Education Student Fees and Support Amendment number two, Regulations NI 2021. There is a clerk's memo, page 169 of your packs, and the SL1 at page 171. This statutory rule contains amendments to the Principal Student Support Regulations, the Education Student Support No. 2 Regulations NI 2009 and the regulations which set out the persons and higher education courses eligible for home tuition fees. Um, the, the, sorry, in Northern Ireland, the Student Fees Qualifying Persons and Courses and Persons Regulations Northern Ireland 2007 eligibility for home tuition fees and student financial support for courses here starting in the academic year 2021-22 will be removed for EU, other EEA and Swiss nationals who are not covered by the citizens' rights provisions of the withdrawal agreement. 
The amendments made by this instrument will mean, therefore, that such persons will receive the same treatment as other international students. So this rule will come into operation in late March. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure um, and there is a revised version of the SL1 has, which following our discussion with the department. The department states that the status quo will continue for ROI nationals. They are not required to have been living in the UK at the end of the transition period and they are not required to have applied to the EU settlement scheme. So, members, obviously we had um, a, quite a comprehensive discussion with the officials regarding this and, and received the, the clarifications that we were looking for. Um, and we have other actions already in progress um, in relation to it. Um, I think John O'Dowd is looking to come in. Um, the clarification from officials and our discussion with officials was very useful the last time. I welcome the fact that we've now clarified the SL1. Um, uh, I'm content to support the uh, regulation before us. But I do think on a broader subject, we are missing an opportunity to uh, make our, 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 our universities and our further education colleges centres of international learning. And what the department needs to be looking at is how we attract international students, not how we deflect international students, which I'm concerned that might be a consequence of some of the things that are going on around Brexit and other things. So I, I, I'd like to return to the subject in the future as to how we, as a mainly English-speaking society, uh, on the edge of Europe can promote our institutions for international students as well as local students. But I, I think it could be a huge economic driver for our society if there was such a strategy in place. Thank you. Just if it's helpful, I think that's one of the things particularly that came out of the conversation with Queen's. Um, I, I've got the impression, Chair, um, from the, the Queen's VC that the stakeholder group of HEIs and FE are thinking very much in the same direction. Um, and hopefully we get more information on how they would seek to do that from the engagement that the committee's agreed to already. Plus we've commissioned um, some research on funding models that we get after Easter and, and also this idea of um, how the University of California has integrated backwards, if you like, down through community colleges, local colleges and schools. And again, that would provide the useful model, um, not only of how you do that, but then how you market that globally. Um, I'm aware of the fact that those American universities that, that have done that do sell globally. So their local colleges, their, their community colleges and so on, are actually bringing in international students. And it's a fully um, integrated program. So I think that's what the stakeholder group is, is now talking about. So absolutely, we start bringing back um, those things once they once they come to the committee and, and this this will be discussed further. Okay, so members are content with the the policy um, direction as outlined because this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL one as it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. So we'll move on then to item number six, which is the SR 2021-50, the Education Student Support Etc. Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. The clerk's memo is at page 180 and the SR is at page 182. This statutory rule provides support for students taking designated higher education courses in respect of the academic year beginning on or after the 1st of September 2021 and makes amendments to the Education Student Support No. 2 Regulations NI 2009, the 2009 regulations. It also makes amendments to the Student Fees, Qualifying Persons and Courses Regulations NI 2007. Uh, the committee considered the SL1 at its meeting on the 9th of December 2020 and indicated it was content with the policy intent. Um, so the rule will come into operation on the 25th of March. Chair, if I can just remind members, this is the one where essentially the department sets up um, the framework and basis of when the uplift in fees comes so that it's already been legislated for in terms of how the student loans will work, how other financial support to students work. So it's, it's if you like, the precursor to that one. 
Um, so it always comes a bit before. That's why we, we got it at the end of last year. Um, and it's just, the, the department got it in early and it's just taken a while to, to come to, get to, to this SR. point. Okay. Um, and Peter, I think it's always worth pointing out in relation to these ones that there have been no increases in student maintenance since 2015 or maybe Might before. Be 14, I think. Um, and the department has says it's looking at its postgraduate support as well. Um, we've been hearing that for a number of months, so it'd be useful to maybe get an update in relation we seek to an that. We'd an update on that, Chair. Um, and that to, to say that we would like to see the student maintenance looked at as well at some point in the very near future. Chair, I suppose that's going to be part of um, the discussions around the new funding model or what funding model the department moves to and also uh, will be part and parcel of the Level 4 and 5 review. Um, where sustainability of funding, support for students and so on, will have to come into that discussion. Um, if the department wants to create the, the continuum they've talked about for education. So those issues will all come back and, and be discussed. Okay, so the rule is subject to negative resolution and the members are content will put the question that the Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2150, the Education, Student Support, etc. Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and has no objection to the rule, subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so moving on then to item number seven, which is the SL1 Higher Education Student Support Interventions COVID-19 Study Disruption Payments. There is a clerk's memo at page 282 of your packs. There is the SL1 at page 219. There is a departmental response uh, to committee queries at page 226. The response around... Um, Legal issues was considered at item number five of the agenda. So this statutory rule will enable COVID-19 study disruption payments to be made to full-time students studying here in the north. This will be a one-off discretionary payment of £500 made before the 31st of March 2021 to all full-time UK and EU higher education students enrolled during the month of February 2021 at our higher education institutions and FE colleges. It is estimated that 39,000 students would receive a payment. So just to remind members that we requested the legal issues to be set out in more detail and the department has advised that while legal advice is privileged, some of the advice received and how it is impacted the delivery of the scheme is set out in their correspondence. The first piece of advice concerned whether the department or any of our higher or further education institutions um, was, um, had the various to deliver the scheme. Current legislation was examined and the department was advised that it did not currently have the power to deliver such a scheme. The Financial Assistance Act NI 2009 was identified as a potentially viable vehicle for giving effect to the scheme and was deemed the most appropriate means of delivering a novel scheme within such a restrictive time period, i.e. before the 31st of March. It was recommended that the Department proceed with caution, particularly when the scheme would, by necessity, be subject to extremely urgent consultation with affected bodies, as well as rapid drafting and implementation in order to meet the deadline, which at the time of the advice was less than two months away. The Clerk has spoken extensively to officials around this um, issue. The Department has stressed the very short period between the Executive agreeing the scheme and its design and implementation before the end of the financial year. This is a key factor in the design of the scheme and the recipients of it. Additionally, the Department highlighted that the annulment of the SR would mean that no payment is made. So just also to highlight to members, it's an executive scheme and any expansion would be impossible within the time remaining to use the funding considering the agreement and design required. Um, I know members have, uh, some people have already indicated that they wish to come in and comment on this. So the statutory rule has already been laid without the committee the agreeing March. to the SL1, which is a little bit odd. It, it is, uh, and, and the department's um, explanation of that was because of the time scale of getting the, um, the payment out. It's one of those situations where normally um, the, the, there's, there isn't this guillotine cut off of the financial year. Um, so the department had moved forward 
laid the SR without the committee having agreed the SL1. The SR is also in the pack chair. Um, and the rule actually the came into scale. operation, so come into operation on, on the 10th, the 10th of March. John payments have not been made yet, I should probably stress that. Sorry. But they, payments haven't been made yet, but they will be. It's fairly imminent, I think. Okay. John O'Dowd. Uh, I was aware the ESR was in place on the 10th of March, and I welcome the fact that there is a regulation in place which allows payments to full-time higher education students, both at our universities and at our colleges. But I think we need to amend the SL1, and we need to ask the Minister to uh, respond to an amended SL1 and enact the will of the Assembly, which was voted on on Tuesday the 16th of March, where the Assembly supported a motion in my name and the Chair's name, which would see support being delivered to all full-time students at colleges, uh, regard up to level three, uh, would probably be the, the set point for that, uh, support for part-time students. And I understand that support for part-time students is more complicated because there's different circumstances for part-time students and, and different financial uh, backgrounds of, of part-time students, but that shouldn't hold back support going to all full-time students at colleges and also students from here studying elsewhere. And, and I, I have asked the minister around three weeks ago to supply me with the regulations which bar her from supporting students from here studying elsewhere, and I'm still waiting on an answer to it. I believe there is a way around this. The department could make the payments directly by uh, checking the one that the students are registered at the university, and that could be a confirmationary letter from the university, either in England, Scotland, or Wales, or down south. Those students will have a student number as well, which can be checked on as well. So there is different ways of auditing this to ensure that public money is being spent properly and wisely. Uh, and I, while there may be a, a barrier to the minister directing, and I suspect there is a barrier to the minister directing universities elsewhere to make payments, I think the department or one of its agencies uh, could make those payments. But I, I would propose that the committee amends the our, our rights to the minister and asks her to amend the ASL1 in line with the assembly motion passed on Tuesday the 16th of March in regards to this matter. You just advise what, what is the process, so it would require a new SR to be laid, is that correct? Chair, essentially what would happen if the, the existing SR that's been laid is annulled, then that payment scheme can't go ahead. I suppose the advice I would offer the committee is that this has been an executive um, supported scheme, so to identify that money. It would be required to do this in the new financial year. You would be needing executive support for that. So it might be a case then, or it would be a case then, of a new SL1 and a new SR. It would widen out the payments, as Mr O'Dowd has suggested. Um, I think that that's one of the things I just want to flag up, is the, the, the potential to jeopardise the payment to the original 40000 by undoing the existing SR when potentially you could build on that um, going forward. Yeah, I, I don't think John was suggesting that we would annul, I think. Fair enough. That he, he was... um, sorry, Chair, can I come in there? Yes, go ahead, Sinead. I, I would uh, concur with kind of the observations that the clerk has made, that Peter has made, because the one thing that we won't, don't want to do is stall the, the, the current payments um, that have got uh, support. Uh, and I know students are patiently waiting on it, and I'm sure all MLAs are getting, you know, where's the money, where's the money, etc., uh, coming in through their uh, emails, etc. Um, I do believe that the situation probably has changed since um, this advisement came out from the department. We have had um, uh, an all-party debate within um, the Assembly, uh, and the, the, the motion was unanim unanimously passed. And a great deal of observations were made uh, around the perceived barriers that the department felt um, that they had to adhere to and the minister herself. Um, however, um, solutions were also offered and some of the um, solutions were looking for ministerial direction within the executive to extend uh, payments to those students that have been um, that have been overlooked in the first cohort. So I would say that, you know, we, we, we uh, let 
the, the, the uh, SR go ahead or SL go ahead, and then uh, we we make a request. The payments are made based on the motion and the overwhelming support that it got um, in the assembly, uh, and that she finds and seeks solutions in order to make those payments uh, and uh, interrogate. Uh, the suggestions that have been made um, and again I think unanimously all parties said if there's a will there's a way uh, and those payments can and should be made and each student has an identifying number uh, and we, uh, and you know there can be confirmations as John said coming through the universities or the place of study uh, and verifications at multiple different levels so we, we there will be and there can be a pathway here there just needs to be uh, a desire within the department um, to do it. So I, I would suggest that we go ahead with with um, the payments and we don't do anything at all to stop them and still fight uh, for the department to do what is right for the rest of the students that have been excluded. Sorry. Uh, th thanks, Chair. <coughs> I don't uh, disagree with a lot which has been said. Obviously, um, members have alluded to the, the debate in the chamber and I think that that was a good debate and it was an opportunity, I think, for people to lay out their uh, concerns and their wishes for what we would like to see for students and, uh, and we're all supportive of that. Um, I suppose just a question maybe for the clerk, if, if he could uh, give us some guidance. The Obviously, nobody wants to see a delay in terms of the student payments being made. I think that that needs to happen ASAP, so we need to make sure that this uh, goes through. In terms of the uh, you know, a potential change, and I am um, happy to, to support writing to the department and, and, and looking to expand it in, in accordance with what was passed in the Assembly. The, the 31st of March, uh, obviously the end of the financial year, where does that leave us? Obviously it will need executive, as you know, this was an executive supported scheme. Where does that leave us in terms of the additional finance? Well, you know, I'm assuming the, there will have to be additional money coming forward uh, that can't be rolled over from the current financial year. Uh, so that in itself will create further, I suppose, delays if, if action was to be taken. Would that be right? Chair, if the current scheme proceeds, it's been budgeted for within this financial year and payments will be made within that envelope. A further scheme would require, again, executive approval. Uh, money could be found if, if the executive was supportive from COVID-related funds, some of which have been managed to be brought into the new financial year, not necessarily for, for this particular um, scheme. So there would be then basically the scenario that you would seek executive approval for an expanded out scheme um, as outlined by members and as contained in that debate. Once that would have executive approval, the executive could identify COVID-related funds and then DFA officials would proceed um, to, to, to design a scheme. I think it's probably worth stressing again that when I've spoken to officials, the key thing they've said is that the big factor um, kind of limiting a lot of what they could do this time around was time. Um, I suppose if, if executive agreement had been a number of months ago, this would have been much more tailored and, and would have had the ability to be much more responsive in design. Um, and I think that's been the, the major sort of issue is, is something that had to be done within a really short space of time to save the money while having the, the maximum impact. So in short, I suppose, executive approval for the new financial year and identified funds from the COVID relief money. Okay, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Guy. John wanted to come back in. Yeah, I just want to make clear, I'm not suggesting we uh, pray against the ASR, which gives me back to the £500 payment, which is before us today. My understanding, and I'll take advice from the clerk on this, is that there are two elements to this procedure. One is the ASL1, which is the policy, and the other is the ASR, which gives effect to the policy. So we either amend the ASL1 to expand the policy, or we ask that the minister brings forward an additional ASL1 and ASR to give effect to the motion passed by the Assembly on the 16th of March. I have a concern that if the committee, and if the committee ratifies this today, it won't, or if the committee doesn't ratify this today, it doesn't make any difference to the ASR, because the ASR will continue, the payments will continue, it just means that the committee hasn't taken a position on it. What I'm saying is that the committee should amend the SL1 right back to the, the Minister and say, we want this amended in line with 
the stated intentions of the Assembly on the 16th of March. Now, if the clerk advises that that will disrupt the payments, then we have to look at it from a different angle. But uh, my, my, my amendment is that the, the Minister has to, has to amend her proposal to in line with the motion passed by the Assembly on the 16th of March. Chair, if I can, if I can clarify, because the SR has been laid, the SL1 ceases to be amendable. If that makes sense, because the SR is there and the SL1 has, if you like, fallen away behind that, it still sets out the, the definition of what the SR will do. But because the SR is now laid and the SR can't be amended, the SL1 itself um, can no longer be modified. So. I, I suppose to clarify what needs to happen then is a new set of regulations, so a new SL1 and a new SR. Um, apologies for, for um, misinterpreting that, that there was any kind of suggestion of annulling this, um, but that, that's where the, the, the action would now have to go to, is a new SL1 and a new SR, based on the debate, based on the discussion committee has had, seeking executive uh, agreement. So I think it's important... Uh, chair of the committee, if it wants to act, gets that message very clearly to the executive. They will have to identify and support the funding, the additional funding that would be required, um, and then asking the department in parallel to come up with the new SL1 and new SR. The way um, the clarification has been set out, there are clearly vehicles to do that. Uh, the department itself has identified those. Some areas are still more complex, but in terms of widening out to FE level students and FE colleges and so on, the instruments are there. The department can do that. I think initially, from, from talking in depth to officials, initially the biggest problem was time. Um, so if members are content at that being the, the direction of travel, so a new SL1, a new SR, seeking executive support to um, find the funding in the new financial year, um, but essentially it's, it's what the committee wants to do. Chair, just, uh, uh, that's fine. In terms of, you know, John O'Dowd has made a suggestion around, um, you know, student IDs uh, and, and, you know, other ways of identifying those who are studying elsewhere but are from Northern Ireland. Uh, you know, I, 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 if those suggestions are, are actionable, then, then absolutely that, that, that needs to be done. So what we need to find out from the department you know, my understanding when you speak to the department is that there's absolutely a will, but they don't see a way. Uh, now, we will obviously encourage them to, to try and find a way. Uh, so if that's a suggestion, then we put that to the department and ask why that, that cannot be done, if that's the reason. Chair, it, it might be worth considering what can be done fast. Um, I think potentially it's worth seeing the existing students at FE colleges at FE level um, as an easily identifiable group where you already have a mechanism of the FE colleges who, who will have had experience putting out money through this current scheme. And then the, the students um, outside here, so the students in GB, the students in the south, it is maybe a, a parallel um, scheme to work out. I'm just, what I, I suppose what I'm saying is to get money quickly, to the FE students where there's already mechanisms, it seems to make sense to go ahead with that as quickly as possible. And then it might take a bit longer to create a mechanism for the others, but that can be done in parallel. It just might take longer. I, I suppose it's just so payments to FE students wouldn't be kind of delayed any further than necessary. Yeah, and that makes sense. I suppose, Peter, because the finance minister did make clear he was open to additional bids, and including for this year, is the time scale too short to action the FE students because as you have pointed out, money has already been paid to FE students. So if we are to look at this in stages, then if there are things that can be still done within the space of this financial year, that should be explored. I think John O'Dowd is looking to come back in as well. Chair, I, I, I don't think I'm in a position to say whether it can be done. I would just suspect it's unlikely we're already into the, the sort of final week and a bit of the, the financial year. So to set up a scheme to then process uh, regulations around it. I, I just think for this current financial year, it would probably be difficult, but um, that's not, you know, that's not for me to say that necessarily. That's really for the department to comment on. Uh, um, well, there's a significant amount of COVID funds 
which the Treasury has allowed the executive to spend in the next financial year. Uh, and this could have been dealt with over this last number of months. There has been significant calls from different groups for the minister to act in relation to those students who've been excluded from the, the COVID payments. But I just want to clarify again with, with, with the clerk. If the committee doesn't take a position today on the SL1 and the ASR that's before us, and my understanding is that that will have no impact, that the, the payments under those regulations can continue. Uh, so I would suggest or propose that the committee does not take a position on the SL1 and the SR before us today, that we write to the minister and tell her and ask her or set out the committee's position, which is hopefully the committee's position, is that the minister must enact the position of the assembly as adopted on the 15th of March and bring forward the appropriate uh, regulations to do that. Chair, absolutely. The, the committee can simply note and uh, reserve judgment or reserve um, any kind of uh, opinion on the, the, the SL1 and the SR. So, as, as Mr O'Dowd said, it, it basically it goes through, it exists, but the committee has withheld its position on it. And, and then the committee can go ahead and um, undertake actions as it, as it agrees to do or chooses to do. So, absolutely, yeah. Chair, um, can I come in there? Yeah, go ahead, Sinead. Um, I wonder is there any way that we could get a quick answer from the department in relation to that so that we could maybe perhaps you know depending on the answer then take a decision tomorrow um all on um john's suggestion uh, on which i think there is an awful lot of gray areas here that we, uh, we just really don't know whether if we're making the right decision and uh, and i would really prefer to have clarification from the department to say what is possible uh, and and then if we, you know in that clarity then make the decision tomorrow you know surely another 24 hours would be would give us a wee bit of time to kind of look at it um, and then when we're together tomorrow we'll make that decision chair um, the the I think from from what the committee has already said I, I don't think there's any um, opposition to the, the, the SR and SL1 are already there. The committee doesn't actually need to do anything. Um, that, that scheme will go ahead. The committee can set aside its approval or, 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 or not of that. So in terms of moving ahead on anything else, as I said, my, my, my officials, discussions with officials have indicated that to create something additional, just it, it, it's so unlikely it could possibly be done within the time frame. Mm -hmm. And I, I think yeah. the worry would be then that it doesn't fulfil... Uh, the wishes of the committee and of the debate um, and it might just be worth to try and include everybody that needs to be included to just take that bit of time um, you know even in terms of, of designing and approving regulations that's going to take that takes time to do so I think it might be worth um, undertaking the actions as Mr O'Dowd has outlined where the committee takes a position and corresponds with both the minister and the executive. So the executive needs to be aware of what the committee wants to do on this um, and takes it forward for a new scheme to be designed, potentially two schemes in parallel. Because yeah. as I'd said before about, you know, there, there's potential to do something much more quickly with the FE students um, than, than the, the more complex situation around students from here who aren't studying here, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So are members content with that course of action and it would mean that we would not take a position on the SL1 simply that's in no, front no, of us? Simply no. we, we simply note it and similarly with the SR, SR. because it makes no difference at this yeah. point anyway. Are members content with that proposed okay. action? Yeah. Yep. Okay, members, thank you very much. So if we, we are just then noting that SL1... Um, and then the SR is item number eight, um, SR 2021-52, the COVID-19 disruption payment scheme regulations Northern Ireland 2021. The clerk's memo for that SR is at page 229 and the SR itself is at page 231. So obviously we have discussed this. The rule was laid on the 10th of March. It's subject to um, negative resolution and it came into operation on the 10th of March. Um, the examiner statute rules hasn't reported on the rule, so members would be agreeing to it, subject to that uh, report. However, members have obviously um, expressed their view that we will simply note this. 
So. Okay. <laughs> okay, so if members can just agree the actions that we want to um, take forward. So it is that we will write to the minister and to the executive outlining the, the committee would like to see the motion that was passed in the assembly actioned um, so that support would be made available to students as outlined in that motion um, and potentially that within the motion different parts of it are decoupled and done in parallel so that different things can be progressed more quickly if that is possible. Is that everything we have to do? I think so, that should be, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, members. So moving on then to item number nine, um, is the SL1, the Employment Rights Increase of Limits Order NI 2021. There is a clerk's memo at page 219 and an SL1 at page 241. This statutory rule will fulfil a statutory requirement placed on the department by Article 33 um, of the 1999 order to adjust limits on statutory awards and payments under employment rights legislation each year on the 6th of April and in line with annual charges in the rate of inflation. The affected figures are the limits on various statutory awards and payments provided for under employment rights legislation. These awards include the amount of a week's pay for the purposes of statutory redundancy payments and the maximum amount that can be awarded by an industrial tribunal following a finding that a person has been unfairly dismissed. The SR is made on an annual basis and is considered to be of a routine and technical nature. The rule will come into operation on the 6th of April. The rule is subject to a laying requirement but not any form of resolution by the Assembly. So this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. So are members content with the policy direction? Okay. Thank you. So item number 10 is the SR 2021-53, the Employment Rights NI Order 1996 Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay Amendment Regulations NI 2021. The Clerk's Memo is at page 252 and the SR is at page 252, sorry, the Clerk's Memo is at page 250. Um, just to highlight, this statutory rule amends regulations 2 and 3 of the Employment Rights Act 1996 Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay NI Regulation 2020. The principal regulations, this legislation replicates a GB statutory instrument, the Employment Rights Act 1996 Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay Amendment Regulations 2021, which were made on the 22nd of February 2021 and come into force on the 31st of March. The amendments to the principal regulations are necessary by further extension of the coronavirus job retention scheme until the 30th of April. The purpose of the statutory rule is to continue to provide greater certainty in the calculation of a week's pay and to ensure that furloughed employees do not lose out as regards certain statutory entitlements which relate to termination of employment by having been furloughed if their employment is terminated while or shortly after having been furloughed under the job retention scheme. The calculation of statutory entitlements relating to termination is based on their normal pay rather than furlough pay. The statutory rule does not affect any entitlements of employees who have not been furloughed. The rule will come into force in on the 31st of March and is subject to negative resolution. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on this rule, so members will be agreeing to the legislation subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. So are members content and will put the question that the Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2021-53 Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996 Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 and has no objection to the rule subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report. Thank you. So moving on then to item number 11, which is the SL1, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Change of Expiry Date Regulations NI 2021. There is a clerk's memo at page 263 and the SL1 at page 265. This statutory rule is to extend the period during which the department can exercise its powers to make regulations under section 28 of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, the SIG Act, which amend or modify the impact 
of corporate insolvency or governance legislation. So the rule will come into operation by the 30th of April. It is temporary for one year until the 29th of April 2022. The rule is subject to affirmative resolution procedure. And this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy laid out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend the rule once it has been made. So are members content with the policy direction? Um, oh, thank you. So moving on then to item number 12, SR 2020-61. This is another Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Amendment, a relevant period in Schedule 8 Regulations NI 2021. The clerk's memo is at page 269 and the SR is at page 270. This SR is to extend the relevant period during which Schedule 8 of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 will apply until the 30th of September. Schedule 8 makes temporary provisions with respect to company moratoriums. The rule will come into operation on the 31st of March and is subject to confirmatory resolution procedure. The committee approved the SL1 policy for the statutory rule at our meeting on the 3rd of March and there have been no changes to policy content since then. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on this rule, so members will be agreeing to legislation subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. So are members content and will put the question? Thank you. That the Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2021-63 Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Amendment, a relevant period in Schedule 8 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report. Thank you. Moving on then to item 13, which is SL1, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act, Amendment of Certain Relevant Periods, Number 3 Regulations, NI 2021. The clerk's memo is at page 277 and the SL1 is at page 279. This SR is to provide for measures under powers conferred by Section 42.1b of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 to expire on the 30th of June instead of the end of March 2021. Section 42 of the SIG Act allows the relevant periods to be extended by up to six months if the Department considers it reasonable to do so. To mitigate the effects of COVID-19, the Department proposes to make regulations to change the dates to the 30th of June, on which all three relevant periods expire as follows. A prohibition on the presentation of winding up petitions where the statutory demand was served during the specified period. Restrictions on presenting petitions to have companies wound up and the making of winding up orders where coronavirus has an effect on the company's finances and exemption for small suppliers from having to maintain supplies to companies which have entered insolvency proceedings. So to advise the members just that the proposed regulations make no alterations to measures already included in primary legislation other than to change the dates on which they will expire. So the rule will come into operation on the 29th of March. It is subject to confirmative resolution procedure. And this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy being set out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made. So are members content with the policy direction? Thank you. Okay, so moving on then to item 14, which is the SL1 combined heat and power quality assurance. The clerk's memo is at page 283 and the SL1 is at page 285. This SR will amend the Re Renewable Obligations Order NI 2009. The amendment to the order, which is temporary, will last for one year from the date of coming into operation. The SR does not contravene Section 24 of the NI Act 1998. The Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy plans to lay a statutory instrument in Westminster on the 17th of March 2021, which will come into force during May 2021. The purpose of this statutory rule is to allow participants to use their 2019 operational data instead of disrupted 2020 data to enable them to qualify for the CHPQA certification in 2021. This applies to those who may have been affected by the ad adverse impact of COVID-19 and its associated restrictions on consumer demand and consequently on heat and power ratios, which may not enable them to reach the benchmark required by the standard. So the rule came into operation the day after it is made and it is subject to draft affirmative resolution procedure. 
that this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. So are members content with the policy direction? Thank you. Um, Peter, what does draft re affirmative resolution so It basically mean? means it's laid without um, a commencement or a necessarily number. It means that they can, because it's got to be confirmed, we, we don't know when that will be scheduled. Okay. So it allows it to be laid and then it can be confirmed and then subsequently it will have a commencement date um, and a number and so on. But it's really just to allow them to get it there before um, it's been finalised in, in all the, the kind of commencement and so on. Um, just means it gets it done quickly. Okay. Um, because of the nature of what it is, there's so much of this is now corona um, related having to legislate where we've never really had to legislate before. Um, so sometimes they come in and draft. It's, it's just a kind of getting it done as quickly as possible sort of measure. Okay, thanks, Peter. So moving on then to item number 15, which is correspondence, and, there, and there's a fair few items to get through. So um, 15... Do you, do you need to take some, some water? <laughs> um, <laughs> just to the fact that you've not really had a breath, or mm. so it might just be worthwhile. Yeah. Okay, so 15.1 then, at page 289, there's correspondence from the Minister with an update on the Limited Company Director Scheme. Um, the LCDSS was designed to provide financial support to company directors who have been adversely impacted by the pandemic and were unable to access support from the, the British government schemes. HMRC raised concerns about the wider tax implication, implications even of the LCDSS if the grant was paid directly to individual directors. Um, the NI would need to operate a PAYE scheme to collect tax for payments to company directors. The operation of a PAYE scheme was ruled out as too complicated and impractical. The Minister advises that a solution has been found and agreed between the Department and HMRC. The original scheme design will be amended so that grants will now be paid to the employing company of the applicant to the scheme. The grant will be beneficial income of the company and any approved grant received will be a taxable trading income receipt in the hands of the company as opposed to a taxable income in the hands of the director. So members content to note that and I'm sure applicants will be really pleased to hear that that has now been resolved. Moving on then. Yeah. Moving on then to 15.2, page 291, there's correspondence from the Minister regarding Ofcom devolution measures for Northern Ireland. The Minister intends to commence provisions within the Digital Economy Act 2017, which relate to here. Members, um, there, just to highlight, there are four proposals that the Executive would appoint a member to the Ofcom board to represent um, the interests of the North that there would be a requirement for Ofcom to lay assign reports and accounts before the Assembly. There would be a requirement for Ofcom to submit reports to and appear before committees here. And that there would be a formal consultative role for the Executive and Assembly in setting the strategic priorities for Ofcom. The Minister advises that the first three proposals would be de delivered through primary legislation and were included within the Digital Economy Bill. This would require a legislative consent motion in the Assembly. The fourth measure would be delivered through a memorandum of understanding between the Executive Assembly, Ofcom and DCMS. The Executive and Assembly will have a formal consultative role in the Ofcom draft annual plan, which sets out its strategic priorities for the forthcoming year. The LCM was laid with the Assembly Business Office on the 11th of January 2017. However, due to the dissolution of the Assembly, the motion didn't progress. The LCM is no longer required as the Digital Economy Act has already been enacted. The Minister has proposed to have Ofcom provisions commenced through an engagement, an exchange sorry, of ex ministerial correspondence and the Joint First Ministers have approved this approach. So are members content to note? Yeah. Page 293 then. Yeah, we might just need to pause there. Mm -hmm. We've momentarily not got quorum, although it will be very quickly coming back. Okay. Um, so we can't... So we, we can't... Because noting is still in action, we still just need to, to, to just pause momentarily for that. Mm -hmm. um, Chair, if I could just actually, at this kind of juncture, talk about tomorrow's meeting. Yep. Um, well, I, I have members to talk to. Um, 
obviously tomorrow is more complicated uh, than usual because we, we're going to have so many members. So the, the pack that will issue, or that has issued, um, just sets out that we've got a mechanism. Um, so each, each committee will have a question in turn, economy, infrastructure, era, economy, infrastructure, era. Uh, and each chair will be the guardian of that list. So it was just really to flag that up to members that uh, if members are content, we just operate our normal um, using the WhatsApp group because it, it kind of works for us. It means there's a record there. Um, I think it, it, the hope is that we will get round the vast majority of people in the two hours that we've got. Um, and you never know, we, we might actually not need the whole time, but I, I suspect that will not be the case. But it's just, there, there'll be a lot of kind of um, if you like queuing and so on, it's just to, to flag that up to members that the, the process will be a bit more laborious than normal, um, just because of the, the the kind of amount of people we need to bring in and, and how that will actually work. Um, but we have our witnesses confirmed. I'm doing final star leaf testing this afternoon, <laughs> worryingly, um, but we we will we will find a way and we'll have four witnesses um, tomorrow as well. Um, we have our own meeting, just to flag that up as well. So we're getting another pack for so that? So you'll have two, you'll have, and you'll also have two Starleaf invitations, because both will be broadcast. So there'll be, the first Starleaf invitation is for the concurrent meeting, and that's your, your 10 until 12, and then the committee's own meeting when we're getting the energy briefing is 12 till 1, so it's a separate um meeting invitation so it means that if you're online it's just a case of moving leaving one and joining the other as as a sort of what you'd normally do for those in the building we will physically move uh, from the senate to here um so it just it just means there'll be a pause between the two before we get everything set up um although now that we have a starleaf set up in here uh, i think we can probably get tommy to bring that up and make it ready um, you know, before we come back in, fingers crossed um, that that will work. The other thing to point out to members is just because of the nature of tomorrow, um, we're, we're going to have to be very tight on questions. So it'll be a question and then we, we'll have to take people out of the spotlight um, just for the whole logistics of the thing and the sound and all that kind of thing. So there won't be an opportunity at that point for a supplementary uh, what we'll do is we'll either come back uh, when members indicate or we will collect those. Um, HMRC and TSS have indicated they're more than happy to um, respond to us in writing and, and you know, whatever if there's supplementary answers and questions that we need to ask. So, Chair, if we just very quickly then seek the members' agreement to note on 15.2. Great, thank you. Perfect, thank you. So moving on then to 15.3, page 293, there's correspondence from the TEO committee regarding a potential COVID um, recovery plan joint meeting. The TEO committee suggests that a meeting would include the interim head of civil service, Jenny Piper, who would be invited to give an update on the pathway to recovery. TEO members Committee members have also su suggested that local business organisations could submit papers to the joint meeting to convey their views on the pathway to recovery. The committee, our committee, has already entered into correspondence with the Economy Minister and TEO regarding the pathways document, and the committee has already sought the views of stakeholder. Um, the clerk has responded, highlighting the committee's work so far, and welcomes TEO's committee plans to exercise an overarching scrutiny role and indicates the committee will share its stakeholder views on the relevant aspects of pathways with the TEO committee to support its scrutiny with um, the, regard to the concurrent meeting. Considering um, of this, we'll return to the committee following responses to its correspondence um, from the Economy Committee, Economy Minister and TEO on this issue. So, sorry, that was that was seeking agreement on that, Chair. So basically, what we've got a situation where we've already got halfway through what they want to do, uh, making it more complicated. So what we're suggesting is writing a sense in letting them know we're halfway through and then saying once we've got the information back, it kind of takes care of a lot of what they're suggesting we, we commission. 
So once we've got that, we then look at um, doing the potentially the, the concurrent meeting because okay. we've already got the information from stakeholders. So it, it, it just means we're, we're probably there faster than we think, but we've given um, stakeholders a couple of weeks to get that back to us. Okay. So if members are content, I write to the, the TEO clerk uh, and just let them know where we're at and then we can start planning towards the concurrent meeting. Yeah. No, that's good. Thank you. Good, thank you. Moving on then, uh, 15.4, page 295, there's correspondence from a further education lecturer regarding the issue of fair pay. Um, just to remind members, the committee has already written to the Minister on this issue to urge res resolution. They, and just also um, that the clerk has asked me to remind members that committees do not intervene in internal industrial relations, including pay negotiations. So if members are content, the clerk will reply to the correspondent pointing out the committee's actions and positions so far. Are members content with that? Thank you. Chair, uh, we haven't had a response, I take it? I don't think we have yet. Chair, we haven't, Peter? No, um, th there's been all sorts of, of developments that have gone on. Initially, there was a, a registered dispute. That, that has now got into process. It's part of, Chair, what I'd said earlier on um, about the whole funding model being now subject to review. The, the, the real concern amongst lecturers is that their pay hasn't kept pace with that of teachers, um, which is always going to be the issue when you've got entirely separate mechanisms. There's an independent body that generally has, has made um, recommendations, and there are all sorts of, of issues and reasons put forward for the differential. Um, but I think it's a case of as part of the discussion around um, the structure of FEHE, how they integrate, you then probably are moving towards a pay continuum that isn't so fragmented that the minute every separate area has got its own pay scales and so on, it's... it's um, and in terms of the independent review, do we know when that will be completed? Not at the minute. It's just it like, obviously, be as MLA, be I appreciate the committee stands yeah. and don't get involved. And I forget the mean, I suppose it's hard to take off your MLA constituency hat when you're getting a lot of these uh, correspondence. So it would be useful if I, I some think clarity from the Chair, if, if it's useful and members want to direct those to me, we can then group them. And that often has a lot more impact. Yeah, we'll do that. Yes. Um, so we let the we can it means we can let the department know without kind of getting into, you know, any level of interference that this is clearly an issue that the committee yeah. wants to have. Similarly, resolution. I've had a number of correspondence um, in relation to this issue, and I'm sure other members have as well. So if you if you get those if you direct those to me, then I can respond, and we can group them so that we can see just what all the issues that are being raised are. Yep. Thanks. Okay, members are happy to do that. They can forward on correspondence in relation to this issue to Peter and he will process. Thanks, Peter. So moving on then to 15.5 at page 297, there's an open letter to elected representatives from Hillmount Garden Centre. Hillmount are appealing to representatives to provide independent garden centre retailers with the same privileges um, as supermarkets and home improvement stores, which... Um, are currently selling products traditionally stocked by garden centres, including plants, compost and grass seeds. So if members are content, we will forward this on to the department for, for his comment. It is, yeah. We kind of, yes, time has caught up with yeah. us on that one. Okay, so moving on then, 15.6, um, page 298, there's correspondence from the Electricity Association of Ireland regarding their report entitled R0 Emission Future. Um, the EAI believes that the report demonstrates that a 70% ambition for renewables in 2030 is achievable on an all-island basis, but moving to a zero-carbon electricity future post-2030 will require significant investment in the all-island grid and ex an accelerated electrification of heating and transport. So are members content to note this um, at this point as the committee will consider it again along with the draft ener energy strategy when that's brought forward? Thank you. Okay. Moving on then, page 360, there is correspondence um, from Include Youth with a request to brief the committee on the threat of closure of the essential skills courses. The clerk um, that can we seek agreement that the clerk will meet with Include Youth as soon as possible to ascertain the issues. Um, and I, I think this is in relation partly to do with ESF funding. 
So it's an issue, obviously, that the committee is already, I suppose, aware of, and I suppose it would do no harm for us if, after you have spoke to them, perhaps to schedule yeah. a briefing with them and maybe some of the other organisations impacted. It'll, it'll be helpful to pin down just all the issues, then I can get together a group, because it's, it's usually a lot more useful, as I said before, when you've got a group of people. Um, and obviously we, we want to make sure we're, we're kind of clear on what it is we're, we're, we're seeking to do there. So if members are content that I'll go ahead and talk to them and get a feel for what all the issues are, and then we bring it back for a brief. Yep. yep. Thank you. Moving on then to 15.8, at page 366, there's correspondence from a pilot regarding changes to the EU Aviation Safety Agency professional pilot licences post-Brexit. This pilot's licences are all EASA, but were issued by the UK Civil Aviation Authority, as is the norm for EU member states. However, post-Brexit, this pilot is not entitled to practice flying in an EASA registered aircraft, nor can he use his air traffic control license in any European country. So are members content that we bring this correspondence to the de department for consideration? I'm very angry about that, I'm very angry indeed. I think that is this an MRPQ issue and I think, you know... It's, it's one of those areas that, that we've often heard about of we will find out these issues once they arise, but it, it does present the issue of Obviously, in COVID time, there's a lot less flying anyway, but it does beg the question, once flying starts again, what will happen with all these pilots? So yeah, but it, there's a clear there issue. There has to be more than this one person. Oh, oh no, this is, this is a sectoral-wide. Um, we know that they're already engaging um, at Westminster. Um, they have a number of MPs that they've got lobbying, MPs from here as well. So it's, it's a full sort of issue that, that's affecting anyone who is flying under the certification of the UK Aviation Authority. Um, I think some aspects, there, there is discussion possibly reaching resolution, because we'd always heard about that thing, planes will still fly, and I think planes do fly, but it's whether the plane and the pilot are following the same set of rules, if that makes sense. Okay. So that needs resolved. Okay, so moving on then to 15.9, um, at page 371, there's correspondence from an individual regarding freedom of information requests to UU and Queen's. Um, are members content to note as the consideration is out with the committee's remit? Thank you. Um, page 371, there's correspondence from an individual regarding the Fiscal Council. Are members content to note? And then at page 377, there is the CBI COVID-19 Working Group notes from its meeting on the 18th of March. Are members content to note that? Page 380, then the 29th report of the examiner's statutory rules. Are members content to note? And then at page 389 is the 30th report of the examiner's statutory rules. So are members content to note that? And then item number 16 is any other business and none has been indicated and so unless anybody has any. Good stuff. So moving on then, item 17 is the date, time and place of our next meeting which is tomorrow morning. Um, the first part of our meeting is the concurrent briefing with infrastructure and era committees which will take place in the Senate at 10am and then there is the economy committee meeting which is at room, in room 30 from 12 or yes. straight after. So basically, as soon as we can get in here and, and get everything switched on and sort that out, chair, yeah. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Okay, chair, apology for my dog. He obviously spotted the postman, <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't like very much. Impressive to get a delivery before noon. Well done. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern